Centre. Uh, for those who haven't met, I'm Brett Gleeson, the manager here at the Centre. So um, delighted to welcome you here tonight uh, and to welcome our, our special guests, uh, Jody Harrison, the member for Charlestown and the Mayor of Lake Macquarie and Labor candidate, uh, Jason Pauling, Liberal candidate, Jane Oakley, Greens candidate and RJ Martin, the independent candidate. Uh, we haven't had replies from Brian Tucker from the, from the Christian Democrats candidate or uh, uh, Tanya Movillo uh, from the No Land Tax uh, candidate. So um, uh, we have the people here who are meant to be here, this obviously, at this point in time. So um, this is a, event is a partnership between uh, the Business Growth Centre and Business uh, Charlestown, uh, and delighted to partner with, with them, uh, as we do on many occasions, to uh, put on some events. Uh, just some housekeeping, um, if you need to uh, find the, uh, either out through that door there, and it's actually right there behind that wall, uh, so you can probably the easiest way to do that. And for the gents, it's actually in the same spot in the next building, you've just got to go a bit, bit, uh, bit further. Um, and in the unlikely event that we need to evacuate, um, not looking too good out there, but we'll never know, uh, we uh, will go out through the, f the main gates at the front and then assemble at the, uh, the big BGC sign at the front uh, and um, see what happens from there. Uh, follow me. Uh, is <laughs> yeah. uh, it's my pleasure now to uh, introduce uh, Narelle Redman, uh, who's the president of Business Charlestown and the 2014 Lake Macquarie Business Person of the Year. Thanks, Brett. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you. We, we um, Business Charlestown and the Business um, having a good night. Um, it's a shame a few more people didn't turn up, but we've got people who we um, need, so thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Duncan Burke, um, and Duncan is going to do um, a facilitator tonight. And Duncan's the... Um, the LCC Relationship Manager for the Hunter Region New South Wales Business Chamber. So please come up, Duncan. Thank you. Well, we, have we done the quick draw? Can I just get somebody to do the quick draw of who's speaking first while, we're, while I get this sort of underway? Maybe Jason? Maybe. No, ladies first, sorry. Here you go, Jason. Oh, Narelle, please. Who's first? No, the other way so you, oh. you That's got a number on it. You've got to come to pick it out. Each person. Oh, okay. Oh. Oh. okay. So put it back in there. You've got to pick out of the box. Oh, okay. So it's got, so got a number on it. That gives you the number you're going to go. Okay, good. Yeah, put the one back in. That's actually a number. That's actually a place. Okay. Oh, I'll put it on the back. Exactly. You'll be able to pick it up. Five numbers in a box. <laughs> 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 position one, Jenny. Three. Four. Jane. Six. <laughs> Luke. Uh, J four. And Jason last. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for uh, inviting me to come along and, and uh, help with your forum tonight. Um, just to give you the, the format that we are going to be running through, each of the candidates will be given five minutes for an opportunity to get up and talk about uh, what the in and around the, uh, the election that is coming up. They'll be giving a 30-second alert uh, before the five minutes is up to, to wrap up. Um, we'll then be coming up with a number of questions which we'll be inviting the candidates to come up and, and also answer as well with a two minute maximum time. What I'd like to do just, just before we get into the, the, the discussions with our candidates here tonight is just sort of put, put everything into a little bit of a context for everyone. And bear in mind as well, although the audience is very uh, low on numbers tonight, this is being live webcast and it will be uh, available on social media uh, probably sometime tomorrow morning, so we, we do hope to get this out to a lot more people. But as I said, my name's Duncan Burke, I'm the representative of the New South Wales Business Chamber here in the Hunter region, um, Narell and Brett, for ensuring that the Charlestown, uh, Charlestown business community is going to have the opportunity to hear from the candidates about what they are going to be doing for the economic backbone of this area, the small business community. In 2011, we came into the election with business confidence in New South Wales at an all-time low. 
we had a government that was not engaging with the business community, and we weren't doing too well on the, on the national ratings as a, as, a, as a state. Thankfully, we have moved on. However, we still see that there's a lot more work to do. In March 2014, the New South Wales Business Chamber launched its policy priorities for the next Government of New South Wales. These five priorities were selected and refined through a very close consultation program with the local chambers, as well as the state chambers, and obviously the, the representatives that make up those from across the state. The five priorities are based on the challenges identified by the chamber, which were uh, highlighted in the 2000 election, but unfortunately remained unmet. Unfinished business highlights five challenges that the chamber believes the next government must meet to continue the growth and prosperity of the state. The five unfinished business challenges were fund and deliver more infrastructure across New South Wales through public asset swaps, revitalise and reform local government, deliver senior schooling more effectively to improve outcomes for younger people, improve New South Wales energy security and address pricing challenges, put New South Wales on the front foot by creating a more competitive tax system. Over the last 12 months, the Chamber has taken this campaign on the road, organising and facilitating 15 unfinished business events across the state to discuss with business their concerns and how these five priorities will be addressed. We've spoken with more than 4,000 businesses and they've all had their say and they're all in agreement that these are the things that the next government needs to be focusing in on. With just one more week left until the big day, this evening presents an opportunity for us to speak to the local candidates and hear what their commitment is going to be to this agenda, but also, and more importantly, to hear what their commitments are to the community and also the businesses that make up it. I encourage you, I know there's not a lot of us, but I'll be asking some hard questions as well, but I encourage you all to make the most of the opportunity and let these candidates know exactly what's important to you, the engine room, of the Charlestown area, the local business community. So thank you, and I wish you all all the best this evening in, in your uh, deliberations. So I'd like to invite Jody, uh, our first candidate to the podium, to give us her five, five minutes of uh, her introduction into what her party will be offering the business Charlestown. Oh, sorry, <laughs> the Charlestown businesses. Thank you. Yes, because it's what life. talk to you. Uh, it was small business that actually brought my family to the Charlestown Electorate 27 years ago when my parents bought a retail boat business. Before that, my dad had worked for a medium-sized sheet metal engineering company which provided construction materials for uh, buildings like the Sydney Opera House, Centrepoint and the Australian High Court. At this boat business, I saw that it was really tough for my parents operating a small business in an industry where there was lots of competition and some big players squeezing their margins. And it was because my parents bought this boat business that my brother was able to go through an apprenticeship and earn a trade through TAFE. I know that healthy businesses and jobs are essential for Charlestown's future. And I believe that government has a strong role to play in creating jobs, both directly and indirectly. In this region, we've seen the effects of the New South Wales government's decision to award 10 state suppliers rather than support manufacturing jobs in the Hunter. Companies like D down at EDI at Cardiff, who've lost more than a third of their workforce because of those government decisions, and those decisions affect not only the workers and families directly affected, but also their colleagues who've seen their mates lose their jobs because of a decision from Sydney. Thorjax is another local manufacturer which has lost staff recently. And whether it's state or federal, we need governments to use their buying power to support local jobs. And that is why Labor is proposing to support businesses in New South Wales and in our regions like this one 
through a 20% loading for New South Wales based businesses during government tendering. And regional companies such as those in the Hunter would receive an additional 5% loading which will create jobs and keep them here in the Hunter. Labor's also supporting small business. News agents, for example, have made it very clear that they strongly support Labor's position of guaranteeing their role as the sellers of lottery tickets in New South Wales. In many suburbs across the region, the news agent is the last local shop left selling newspapers, groceries and anything else that the community needs. Labor will not see the last of these community shops close because of supermarket monopolies. Pharmacists will direct, directly benefit from Labor's plan to authorise them to deliver flu, vac flu vaccinations, but all businesses in the area will benefit from increased productivity and less sick days from employees who benefit from being able to easily access flu vac vaccinations. When businesses have access to skilled employees is perhaps the greatest benefit that government can provide to business. The New South Wales Business Chamber has all of Labor's education policy, including a landmark review of education and training in New South Wales after Year 10. Labor's plan to rescue TAFE by scrapping smart returning fees to an affordable level indexed to CPI and restoring the joint group training scheme to support businesses take on apprentices will employees. I've heard a number of reports from businesses who refuse to take on people trained at certain private training organisations because they're just not quality employees. TAFE remains the quality standard in technical education and Labor will ensure that it remains so. In the past four years, TAFE has lost over 1,000 teachers and fees have doubled or tripled and seen some courses scrapped altogether. Quite often students are paying these fees but I know in a lot of cases employers I know that in a lot of cases employer, employers are actually paying these fees and so they're actually paying increased fees to TAFE as a result of this government's decision in relation to smart and skilled. In summary Labor will support business through using its purchasing power to create local jobs and support regional economies increasing the services which can be provided by some small businesses and restricting sales of some items to small organisations and improving the health and skills of workers employed by local businesses. That's why I put to you that Labor is best placed to support local businesses in this region. Thank you, Jody. I'd like to invite Luke Arms, our independent candidate. Sorry, I'd like to invite RJ Martin, an independent candidate, to give us his five minutes. Thank you. Hello everyone and welcome. A little bit of information about me. Uh, at the moment, I'm a researcher with Australia's largest private research company, as well as a photographer running my own small business. Uh, I have a business degree, which included law, economics, and a few other topics, as well as TAFE qualifications. Now, what I'd like to discuss is, pertains to business in the local area in particular. Uh, we should have uh, harmonisation, uh, I'll go into what we should have in my opinion, what we shouldn't have as well. Uh, we should have harmonisation of state business laws as much as possible. Uh, that includes that of trade licensing. If there's a, say, painting contractor in Coolangatta or Tweed Heads, vice versa, then they shouldn't have to pay, you know, extra fees to the other state just to operate uh, across the border, especially in cases where, you know, the border's literally the other side of the street. We should have a reduction in red tape uh, in general. Uh, for instance, back in 1995, uh, the... Oh, sorry. Uh, in 1936, uh, Australian tax legislation was 126 pages long. 
By 1995, it was over 5,000 pages long. By 2011, it was 13,000 pages long approximately and had some 9.5 million words, which was 12 times that of, in length of the Bible. There's not much point of having legislation which is so voluminous that no one can possibly understand it, comprehend it, act within that so-called law. Other issues include uh, transport uh, issues, including eliminating road bottlenecks such as City Road, uh, Hillsborough Road, etc. Uh, Fassi Fern to Hexham Rail Bypass, which will cut out a lot of uh, traffic for the Adamstown Gates, for instance. It also makes uh, freight a lot cheaper. Uh, I would prefer there to be a shipping container terminal in Newcastle instead of a fourth coal loader. Uh, it makes imports, exports cheaper, it saves time, money and diversifies the economy. The government should uh, procure lo locally when it can and uh, some things that I'm against uh, that have occurred in a local area include the assault on local businesses of, uh, say, the Swansea CCTV cameras. Uh, they were paid for by the state government, uh, introduced to combat vandalism by the so-called Swansea rats. Apparently it was quite effective. And the council and incumbent member uh, was in a newspaper demanding that uh, people get development app filming council footpaths and using council airspace. I disagree with that. Uh, I also disagree with the council and the incumbent members by Nothing New Month, which was for all of October. Uh, the council and the current member was encouraging people to purchase Nothing New except for bare essentials for that month. There's other things like sea level caveats, which uh, you know affect businesses uh, not as much as residents. Uh, Labor, Liberals. The Greens and ILA voted in 2012, the council unanimously voted, uh, for a 70% rate rise uh, for residents over a seven year period and a 90% rate rise for local businesses. That makes business less competitive in the area, makes it more expensive to do business, uh, less employment opportunities, etc. I've publicly fought against uh, that rate rise uh, spending my own money to do so within uh, the context of the mayoral election. Uh, the rate rise was so high that IPART granted option two instead of the maximum option, which was 50% for residents and 70% for businesses. Uh, there's also other issues, uh, you know, internationally as well with the federal government, such as uh, Labor's Lima Agreement back in 1975, uh, which was for the inter international redistribution of wealth and uh, led to manufacturing plummeting in Australia, uh, as well as the Liberals' Trans-Pacific Partnership, which harms Australia, which is currently being negotiated. Imagine a representative in Parliament who is consistent, competent, e empathetic, intelligent and with integrity, one who takes you seriously and will never ever give up. That's me, RJ Martin. Thank you. Jane Oakley, the Greens candidate, to have her five minutes. Hi, thanks, Duncan. Um, I'd just like to pay my respect to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Awabakal people, and pay my respect to their elders past and present. And I'd also pay my respect and acknowledge you people for coming tonight. I appreciate you making the effort to engage with democracy and, and vet the candidates that are before you. Um, I'm a small business owner. My husband and I have operated a computer sales and repair business here in Lake Macquarie since 2008 and it's going really well. Uh, he's the technician, the wizard, and I do the administration. We're at the point where we could look at employing someone, uh, but that would mean, heaven forbid, actually doing some marketing on my part and I would need to better understand the more complex areas of small business such as payroll, uh, workers' rights and conditions, superannuation and all those things which are currently located in my too hard basket at this stage. The Greens are an ally to small business because we believe in fairness and a level playing field. It's the Greens who have stood up for farmers and food producers locally whose livelihoods are under threat from CSG. 
We stood up for Hunter Industries, whose very existence is threatened by expansion of the coal mining industry. And locally, we've worked with the Newcastle Fishing Co-op, and at where our local fishing industry is under threat because of plans for gas exploration and drilling off the Swansea and Charlestown coastline. The Greens recognise that the small, uh, small business is the engine room of the economy and a healthy small business sector is essential to a thriving economy. To help small business, the Greens have a, a number of measures that we've proposed, which include cutting the company tax rate to 28% for businesses with a turnover of less than $2 million. We suggest raising the instant, instant asset write-off threshold to $10,000. We want to provide greater practical support and advocacy to the small business sector by strengthening the role of the Small Business Commissioner. And in New South Wales, we want to give the Small Business Commissioner real teeth to crack down on large business unfair practices against small business. The Greens have been saying for many years that we need to be investing in diversity, diversifying our local regional economy. As increasing uncertainty appears over mining and with jobs and businesses affected by market forces, the responsible poly policy approach is to look for alternatives. We believe that a renewable energy industry offers a perfect alternative. Newcastle University research shows that 73,000 jobs could be possible if we shifted to a renewable energy sector. This would offer small businesses opportunity in manufacturing, research, design, sales, maintenance, logistics, transport and administration. We also see an opportunity to support small business by investing in our public transport system in New South Wales and building and maintaining that, uh, that fleet in an ongoing stock replacement, replacement program here in, New, in Newcastle. However, one of the largest impediments for us to achieve these initiatives is not that the technology isn't ready or that we don't have a good manufacturing uh, infrastructure. The biggest impediment to the lack of is the lack of a workforce with the necessary expertise. And at a time when locally we have segments of our youth with an unemployment rate of 32%, we should be making it as easy as possible for our young people to get qualifications and training. We should be making it easy for workers to gain new skill sets so that they can broaden their own work prospects. Yet, as has been said previously, we continue to see TAFE being eviscerated with funding being cut, with programs uh, being reduced and with staff being laid off. Yet we know that investing in education is investing in our future and investing in our economy. Again, research shows that every dollar that is spent in the TAFE system provides six dollars back to the economy. We should be increasing our investment in our vocational training and not uh, cutting it. So as a small business owner, I am very happy to stand for the Greens because the Greens policies produce a society where people are ready, able and willing to work. Ready to work because they are educated and skilled, coming from strong public schools, TAFEs and universities. Able to work because they are supported through social policies, which include childcare, preschools, housing, disability support, ageing support, carer support and reliable public transport. And they're willing to work because the Greens support a, fair's, a fair day's pay for an honest day's work. So again, I'd just like to thank you all for coming tonight. That concludes my, my spiel. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jane. I'd like to welcome Luke Arms, another independent candidate. Podium, thanks. Thank you. Well, good evening. Thanks so much for hosting tonight's forum. As you've heard, my name is Luke Arms, independent for Charlestown, and it's great to have this opportunity, not just to speak about my thoughts on business in this region, but also to hear from you about how the state government can do more to support you as Charlestown's business leaders. I'm well aware of the economic challenges we face in this part of the world, uh, of the increasing pressure for businesses to compete on price rather than on quality, uh, on the frustration of differentiating yourself from online competitors, domestic or overseas, who don't necessarily face the same overheads you do. It's a difficult time to be in business, uh, but with the right mix of innovation, determination and good policy, I firmly believe Charlestown has a bright future as a business hub. First, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm 32, I'm married to Michelle and we live in Cardiff with our two kids, Josiah's five and Katie's three. We've decided that two's enough. 
Uh, a few years ago, I was working full-time in my own photography business uh, with a studio in the Newcastle CBD. Uh, when Katie was born and Michelle was keen to be a full-time mum, I made the difficult decision to return to, tra to traditional employment in IT. So I've closed the studio and I'm now managing the IT department at a local school while doing commercial headshot photography after hours. I also volunteer with an organisation called Heartfelt, providing free photo sessions to families who experience stillbirth or have children with serious illnesses. Uh, this desire to help people, caught in circumstances they can't control, is what has drawn me to politics. Uh, it's easy to be cynical about how useful government can really be. Uh, but, regardless of its limitations, it can't be denied that government is in a unique and powerful position to improve people's lives, to advance humanity and to protect our planet. Government has the ability to take necessary but costly action where others just can't. Uh, I'm running for office because I want to help government do more good and less bad in New South Wales. I haven't joined a party because in my view the small parties lack effectiveness and the big two haven't been able to sh shake the self-interest that is embedded in their political culture. This is despite the hard work of many selfless and passionate individuals in these parties, some of whom I count as friends. I can only conclude that serious-minded, level-headed independents have a critical role to play at this point in Australia's political history, which is why I'm standing as an independent. Being an independent, I don't have a policy for every area, but I do have four priorities that summarise my overall platform. I'll briefly outline how I see business interests fitting into these, and then I'll stop talking. Uh, firstly, health, education and a fair go. I don't think it's fair to expect people in our communities to improve their circumstances while implementing policies that reduce their disposable income and make it more difficult to access quality education, healthcare and other basic essentials. As one example, the Baird government has dramatically cut funding to TAFE, instead offering increased funding to private training operators. Leaving aside this annihilation of TAFE, some of our most reputable RTOs haven't received funding under Baird's so-called Smart and Skilled program. And the stories I'm hearing across some of our most important sectors, from early childhood education through to nursing, are just devastating. People simply can't afford to complete their courses anymore, which means they can't get jobs, which means they're trapped in a poverty cycle, which means they don't have money to spend in your businesses. I believe the government's role in this scenario is to do what it can to maximise the spending power of low to middle income earners, which is why I'll work hard to restore funding to TAFE schools and healthcare, and why I'll, why I'll oppose unfair privatisation in every sector. Lots of happy consumers are good for business, good for the economy and good for our collective well-being as a society. My second uh, priority is accountable government. I believe that robust and transparent dialogue between, polit between politicians and constituents, expressed openly in public forums where anyone can engage easily, should be the lifeblood of, mo of modern politics. I'm already pioneering the use of unmoderated social media for accessible and accountable communication with my electorate, and I'll continue this if I'm elected. As I'm sure you're aware, business is mostly about taking calculated risks, and providing transparent, stable government can be enormously useful when making those calculations. Third, removing big money from politics. I believe government should balance the competing concerns of all voters, from business owners through to people who are too disabled to ever earn their own income, which is why I'll campaign for common sense reforms that return power to the people starting with significant reductions to campaign spending limits, especially third-party campaigns like those mounted by unions and big businesses. Fourth, intelligent policy. Governments must listen to relevant experts and take independent advice. As Isaac Asimov famously penned, democracy doesn't mean my ignorance is just as good as your knowledge, which is why I'll demand the government use evidence rather than ideology to support its policies. Anyway, that's enough from me. I'll stop talking and I look forward to hearing from you after this. Thanks. Last candidate, uh, Jason Pauling. <coughs> Thank you and good evening. Um, I'm Jason Pauling, Liberal candidate for Charlestown. I'm a businessman and I say that with pride, not as a confession. Um, I started my work life with BHP and have worked in big business. I've also made some changes and I've worked in small business. So to put that in some context, I've worked in businesses with, with turnover as low as $250,000 and I've worked, I personally managed contracts into tens of millions of dollars and have worked in projects as big as $16 billion. So I, I understand the full gambit. As a businessman, I know that it's important that small business needs to think on its feet, that they don't get script writers, and that words are cheap. That's one of the key things that everyone needs to consider. 
So I've talked about my experience and also talk a little bit about my rules of business. I really only have two rules in small business. One is I cover my costs and I look after my budget. And the second is I don't work with people I don't trust. If someone lies to me and I find out, that's it for, that's it for me. And I think small business understands that more than anyone else. We've talked about um, support this evening with respect to a few select special industries, but I don't think cherry-picking protectionism will save New South Wales. Government is not business. That is really, really clear, and I want to make that, uh, that point so that everyone understands. However, financial responsibility does matter. Decisions matter. Reinvestment, building and setting a foundation for the future does matter. So in terms of that, I think the elephant in the room is quite clearly poles and wires. I think there'll be some discussion on that a little bit later. Um, but essentially, what is happening, and I'll explain this very, very clearly so that everyone understands, uh, because I'm not sure that the whole community and even some of the publications going around uh, understand this clearly. Poles and Wires is about the leasing of 49% of the distribution network of the electricity system. State government will keep ownership. That's number one. The rent will be paid in advance and will generate about $20 billion in total, which will allow the state government to reinvest in infrastructure, which in turn, through the multiplier effect that has been mentioned previously tonight, will multiply through the economy to create about $300 billion worth of flow on investment. On top of that, there are tens of thousands of jobs required uh, that will be generated from that. So this is really, really simple. Infrastructure, sp infrastructure spent up, electricity pricing down. That's really important. Once again, in terms of electricity distribution, privatised networks, ha pricing has decreased. There's information out contrary to this, however, that evidence is very, very clear and has been misleading. So that's uh, some of the key bits that uh, I would like to say in relation to poles and wires. One of the other things, in terms of promises, in terms of utopia that might be offered, as a small business person, I always come back to, who pays? Tonight, I've presented a plan that will deliver better roads through infrastructure, better schools, better health outcomes. We have a plan to pay for that, which is leasing 49% of the poles and wires. Any other promises, the question needs to be, where does the money come from and who pays? As a small business person, I understand that. And that's very, very important. And I hope that all voters take consideration of that in relation to uh, their decisions on the 28th of March. For me, um, one of the things that has always sit, sit well with me is tragedy of the commons, uh, which is a, a, a scenario whereby people put their own interests first and slip that extra. It, it goes back to uh, Middle England, where um, central area that everyone can use. If everyone slips one more little sheep or one more little cow into that field, eventually it fails to the detriment of everyone. In terms of performance in the past, um, in the introduction we talked about in 2011 things weren't so rosy for New South Wales. Uh, and I think, that, I think that's a dead shame, particularly in relation to small business. In New South Wales there are 680,000 small businesses and they employ 42% of the New South Wales workforce. This is a big deal. This needs to be run, done right and small business needs to be supported. Uh, I'm sure the questions later this evening will give me the opportunity to talk a little bit, about, a little bit more about key points, uh, and I look forward to discussing those further. Thank you. So what we'll do for this next section, we'll, we'll grab some questions from the floor. Uh, they can be directed to a individual candidate, um, and then we'll give the other candidates, if they wish to, the opportunity to also speak on that topic. So is there any questions that we'd like to start off with from the floor? I'll throw the first one up. Over the past four years, our region has been subject to some testing political events. Uh, corruption, misuse of pub public funds has really bred an apathy and distrust toward the political system. What will you do to restore this confidence? And maybe we'll start with the, the obvious one in the crowd, <laughs> the, somebody from the Liberal Party. So Jason, maybe you can shed some light on that first. Absolutely. Uh, very difficult. Uh, in, in terms of where things are, certainly in relation to most recent events, ICAC, there are no findings yet, uh, so I think we need to be careful in that regard. However, let me very, be very clear. There is no place in the government 
the Liberal Party or with anyone, I think, in this room with respect to inappropriately obtained funds that are not declared. Um, I think the number one lesson is be super, super careful. Uh, I don't know if there's much more to say than that. Uh, it has been disappointing that the political careers of some otherwise promising politicians were, I think, destroyed. There's no other way to say it. Destroyed and decimated uh, in relation to some poor decision making on their part. Uh, as I said, Judge is still out in relation to the most recent ones. Uh, I think there's a few legal challenges in relation to others as well. So it's very difficult to comment too much. However, what I will say is uh, ultra caution and certainly that lesson has been well, well learnt, I think, by all in the room. And uh, we will all be very, very careful to restore that confidence. Thank you. I think <clears throat> actually there's a lot that we can, a lot more that could be said on this topic. Uh, the Greens have been calling for reforms on donations to political parties for over a decade and a half, calls that have been resisted by the two major parties. And that's an area where we can certainly look at putting some more robust, mo more robustness into our political systems and how they operate. Donation reform is a, a critical element that needs to be explored. If we've got corporations that can give thousands and thousands, of, in fact, up to millions of dollars to political parties, then the, the uh, opportunity for corruption will always be there. Uh, and I would just say that we haven't seen any Greens in front of ICAC. We can come back and you can ask that question in a sec, John. Is there any other candidates that would like to speak on this topic? That's okay, we'll go. Um, I'm not going to go into past members. I don't think there's any point in doing that. Um, I do think there is a point in talking about the need to restore trust, which has been mentioned by both the previous, um, previous speakers. Um, and. It's something that I'm constantly hearing from people out there, that they want to have elected members that they trust. Uh, I would ask that people judge each of the candidates on their history, uh, and I am certainly happy to have my history uh, looked at in detail and um, be open about that. As I said, rebuilding trust is something that I'll be working very, very hard to do. <clears throat> so I think a lot of it's about uh, managing perceived conflicts of interest. For instance, if there was, uh, say, a paid director of a private organisation, local government, New South Wales, that uh, in 2013 that uh, their business arm, uh, local government procurement, uh, through 19 contracts provided $3.5 million worth of you know, products, services, goods to uh, Lake Macquarie City Council that uh, I'd be interested in finding out uh, how well that conflict is actually managed. And also another thing that I've uh, pushed for a while is uh, electoral funding and electoral law reform. Uh, I think it would make more sense, be more fair uh, to especially, you know, the little guys, but to level the playing field if instead of uh, saying, having, ha handing out how to vote cards that uh, in a booth uh, you get, say, A6 or A4 piece of paper that has the people's policies, their how to vote uh, information, etc. And if uh, we have in New South Wales... Uh, government-funded, uh, so-called, uh, electoral campaigns, uh, if people manage to get more than 4% of uh, primary votes, uh, first preference votes, that is, uh, that perhaps the government could send out, you know, a little booklet uh, with everyone's policies, A4, A6, whatever, a couple of pages, uh, that everyone has access to that book, who's a uh, candidate, and that goes to every household and business. Thanks, AJ. Uh, is there a question from the floor? Uh, yeah, we're inviting questions now. Everybody said, did you want to have a... No, go that one. Yeah, sure. A question directed to uh, Jody. Jody, you mentioned that uh, you would support uh, government procurement, but isn't that a bit like government trying to back winners and works against the free market forces of the economy? Uh, 
uh, I think government being involved in procurement to support New South Wales jobs and uh, regional jobs is a socially responsible thing to do. I think a government that recognises the multiplier of creating jobs uh, in a local area and, and the economic benefit that, that has, not just for those people who have the jobs directly, but also the businesses that uh, benefit from that income, uh, is a good thing. I think that what we're seeing now is we're seeing a lot of businesses hurting because there are people who are losing their jobs, 263 or something since Christmas in, in uh, the rolling stock industry. Uh, and those people aren't spending money out in, in, in businesses at the moment. They are... Um, concerned about the future and so what is happening is that financially businesses in this region are losing out because those people don't have jobs and I think government has a responsibility to be involved in that. Anyone else like to have a comment or response to that question? AJ? So I support, uh, you know, local government procurement as long as it's reasonable. Uh, it used to be a thing that uh, countries strive for autarky, self-sufficiency, uh, self-reliance. Unfortunately, that's gone by the wayside uh, in the past, you know, 30, 40 years. Uh, there's also defence aspects uh, to just say if all our tanks, planes, Air Force jets, etc., are made in China, if we ever go to war with China, what do we do? Besides, we'll probably lose anyway due to the population. But at least we could have a fight. Thanks, RJ. There's another... Oh, just Jason. Um, yeah, I think it's important to probably run the, the counter view to what's come forward uh, previously. Government, a bit like small business, is in the unenviable position of balancing value for money versus supporting those nearby. If, uh, if a supplier becomes grossly inefficient, then that supplier needs to either improve, become competitive, or it will fail. That is one of the harsh realities of small business, and small business knows that better than anyone. Um, in terms of at what point do governments make decisions, I think that's the hard call. Uh, and certainly in terms of commitment to small business, supporting where appropriate, awarding contracts where appropriate, but not at all costs uh, in terms of gross inefficiency, um, is a central element, I think, a really important consideration any decision that's made. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'd like to respond to that one. Um, I think when you're looking at international options for acquisitions that need to be made by Australian governments, you have to, you, the, the socially responsible point has to be made that if you're purchasing something from a country that has terrible work conditions, uh, aren't you just sponsoring an incredibly badly uh, bad, badly considered social policy? I, th I think you need to look at that uh, as part of this consideration. That's all I would add. Okay. Is there another question from the floor? Brett? Yeah, I guess it's a general... A general question, I guess, pertaining here to the centre itself. Uh, we're a unique organisation in Lake Macquarie in the service that we provide. Uh, yet we've not received any state or federal government funding for operating our, our service, our advisory service for small businesses. No matter what statistic you use, Lake Macquarie uh, is bigger than Newcastle, uh, population, number of businesses, etc., etc. Yet the funding still goes to Newcastle. Uh, what would you do as a local member to provide a level playing field where this centre uh, is disadvantaged because it cannot show a history of performance because it's never been funded because it is it is the newest BEC in the Hunter region. Uh, the others get funding because they've been around longer and maintain that funding because they can show performance and we can't show a track record. I'd be interested to see what you, what you uh, can say. Who would like to go first? Jay? <laughs> Uh, I, I think, Brett, yeah, uh, a, a point really well made. Um, congratulations that you stay alive without funding. Uh, I think that's fantastic in the first instance. Uh, and that is one of the dilemmas that comes in terms of um, supporting and advocate, advocating on your behalf. Um, certainly something that 
I would be very, very serious about. We've talked about multiplier effects, we've talked about small business, um, the vast numbers of small businesses in this region. Um, how you overcome Novacentric type attitudes is difficult and that will come down to the representation of the local member. Um, certainly I think we've, we've probably seen some elements for a long, long time in terms of the regional capital and the identity for which Lake Macquarie, um, though acknowledging that this is the Charlestown state electorate, uh, but Lake Macquarie has suffered for identity in some regards uh, and it needs really, really strong um, conviction in terms of that representation and a degree of fairness. Uh, but as I said, hats off, congratulations that you have survived as you are. Imagine what you could do with a little injection of funds. This centre is a registered training organisation and there's been some funds lost recently under Smart and Skilled. Um, so obviously uh, Labor is talking about rolling back, if it wins government, rolling back Smart and Skilled, which will mean uh, in an injection, re-injection of funds into this centre by, um, you know, by flow on um, through registered training organisations. I think also originally this centre may have been set up when Labor was in government. Uh, I think there is a strong commitment from Labor to centres like the Business Growth Centre. Um, and certainly uh, from a regional point of view, from, from Charlestown's point of view, uh, the, the fact that Labor has said that, they're going to, that we are going to put money into the Lake Macquarie Transport Interchange to finish it, that we will work uh, and strongly reconsider the resources for regions commitment means that Lake Macquarie in this particular area is firmly on the map in Labor's mind. Being a, a candidate in an election means that you have to get your head around an incredibly vast array of issues and I have to uh, be candid and say that this is one that I haven't put much research into. I've been working on my own small business largely today. Um, but I can take that question on notice and prepare a response from the Greens for you, Brett. Uh, Jay or Luke, would you like to have a response also? So I require more information. I'm happy if elected, which you know is possible, but probably not probable, uh, to sit down and discuss that with you uh, later. I'm unsure of you know if this is only centre within Lake Macquarie, uh, what services are provided uh, by uh, this uh, centre, etc. But uh, I do uh, always advocate getting the most bang for buck. If uh, organisations like the Business Growth Centre help local businesses to improve, you know, local employment, uh, local uh, income, revenue, uh, then that's a more worthy co cause, perhaps, than some of the other projects. Yes. Is there another question? I'll I'll, uh, I'll, I'll throw one into the into the uh, into the bucket, um, and this is to Jody. Given the Labor Party's opposition to the leasing of the poles and wires, how do you propose to fund the infrastructure investments required to grow local business here in the Charlestown area? Uh, there is a, a $10 billion infrastructure fund that is partly funded uh, by, uh, f from, from funds from the leasing of the port. Uh, and partly funded by some um, tax, uh, deferral of tax um, uh, reductions for a very small number of small businesses in relation to property transactions. Uh, so that's how $10 billion uh, would, that infrastructure fund would be funded. Uh, I'll be very clear about that and honest about that. Um, but I also want to uh, be clear that all of the um, commitments that Labor has, Labor has given throughout this campaign have been fully costed by the Parliamentary Budget Office. This is the first time that an opposition has ever had its commitments fully funded by the Parliamentary Budget Office and the Parliamentary Budget Office has said that 
in, a f in uh, the first year of a Labor government, there would be a surplus larger than a surplus than uh, of, of the current Liberal government. Anybody else like to add comment to that? Okay. So polling uh, says that statewide the Liberal government has basically won this election. Uh, I have no reason to believe that Mike Baird won't be uh, continuing on as Premier uh, into you know, the next few years. Uh, therefore, no matter who is elected for Charlestown in particular, you'll still receive the uh, you know, assuming the uh, polls and wise still get leased out, uh, which is likely, uh, you'll still receive all the goodies that Mike Baird promised. Uh, in return for that, uh, there is an opportunity cost uh, lost if the money isn't received and reinvested, uh, loss of multiplier effect, etc. And uh, the government can invest uh, with the asset recycling scheme into more efficient infrastructure that gives more bang for buck, that uh, isn't cutting into local, you know, what local businesses should be doing. And uh, that's all I have to say on it. Interest rates at the moment are very low and the Greens would look at uh, borrowing $20 billion and we can fund the repayments of that by doing things with our taxation. So we could look at taxing property speculators, uh, taxing uh, the large clubs um, uh, poking, uh, the poker machines in large clubs uh, and maintaining stamp duties on business transactions that were scheduled to be abolished. So by doing different measures like this, there's no need to sell off public assets. We can keep public assets in public hands for the public good and fund our hospitals and our schools by looking at creative taxation measures. Luke? Jason? Would you like to comment? You can indulge me a little bit tangentially. Um, certainly, my, wherever you borrow uh, and take on debt, one day you need to pay it back. Uh, that, that's the first thing. Uh, the next thing, I'll take some quick, uh, make some quick quotes in relation to, uh, from Paul Sheehan, uh, who did an article recently, mainly about the polls and wires and the trade-off in relation to the dividend. So the forward projections in relation to um, the potential dividend, should polls and wires remain wholly within government, fall off quite quickly uh, and reduce quite markedly to be seven, um, they start at 1.7 million billion, come down to 736 million for 2015-2016, 642 million for 2016-17 and 407 million for 2017-18. So in terms of bang for buck, uh, in terms of you've got an asset that is delivering very, very rapidly declining uh, return on investment, uh, and there's the opportunity, as we said, invest now, infrastructure up, electricity cost down, um, increase spend on schools, increase spend on health, and most importantly, increase spend on infrastructure uh, with a way to pay for it. Thank you. Any more responses? Any more questions? Uh, thank you. I have a question for Jason, the Liberal candidate. With regards to, and now I, I'm not sure whether I, I misheard, but you you made mention that with the sell-off of the poles and wires, um, people's electricity costs would decrease. I'm not aware of any privatisation of a public asset in the past where the consumers, the cost of the consumer has actually decreased. In um, as far as I'm aware, it increases and continues to increase. So, could, would you mind explaining just how that will, the the cost to the the average consumer will go down? Absolutely, no, no real issue there. Uh, in terms of facts on electricity, and this is one of the, I think one of the key misunderstandings that needs to be spelled out. In Victoria and South Australia, the privately operated prices went down. In Victoria, in Victoria by 70%, in South Australia by 17%. Conversely, New South Wales and Queensland previously, which were government operated, up 122% and up 140%. Uh, in relation to the leasing, Mike Baird, uh, in a press announcement, um, made it very, very clear that the tenders are conditional on cheaper electricity prices. So in terms of not only does privatisation deliver better outcomes by focusing on efficiency of production and driving prices down, the tender conditions are conditional on delivering 
cheaper distribution electricity prices. Um, so hopefully that's sufficiently clear. I, I can find some more information and, and get that to you in due course, but uh, to lay it out really, really clearly, all evidence where uh, distribution has been privatised has driven distribution prices down and the tender conditions are conditional on that. Would anybody like to make an, a comment? No? Are there any more questions? Oh, I've got one more, sorry, that was phoned in at the last minute and it's from a, a industry group here that um, seems to be, or well, they're telling me that they are struggling and, and I, with the growing importance of tourism in the region, how will you or how can you ensure that the local industry is going to be given the assistant, assistance it needs to remain competitive? Does anyone want to talk about the tourism? Tourism? Remaining competitive? Yeah. Assistance? <laughs> Um, yes, so as I mentioned in my five minutes that we see diversification across the region as very important uh, and tourism has a huge role to play here locally. Uh, we announced uh, last year in the by-election that we want to increase funding to Tour Tourism Australia by $100 million uh, in order to better promote the natural assets of our region and promoting tourism is behind our um, concerns is one of the reasons behind our concerns about what we see happening with our mining industry and the negative impacts that expanding a mining industry and failing to diversify our energy sector is having on our tourism industry. A lot of uh, what needs to be said in relation to support for tourism actually relates to the entire, there's a new term around called visitor economy. So it's not just the tourism operators uh, that uh, are important uh, in the whole language of tourism now, it's, it's the other uh, providers, the restaurants, the, um, the, the, the events companies, all of those kinds of organisations that need to be vibrant as well. Um, and I think that uh, one of the things that we need to do better in this region is to uh, include everybody in the discussion about tourism and visitor economy um, and uh, the, the, the people who add on to visitors uh, need to work really, really well with tourism operators. I think also one of the other things that we need to do in this region which hasn't happened particularly well, particularly in, in this local area, is um, money supporting events. There's been a lot of money going to, uh, go to Sydney uh, from um, uh, Tourism New South Wales, um, Visitor Economy New South Wales, and, and that's great, uh, but it's important that we get a fair share of that money, uh, and I am more than happy to work as hard as possible, including with various events. We saw the ICG here last year. You know, that we, we got some money for, for that. It would have been better to see more. Uh, and there are some other events that are around that certainly will be needing a big kick um, in from, uh, in f uh, from government for money. Jason. Thank you. I thought there'd be a bit more of a rush for tourism. Uh, at a personal level, um, have been strong supporter and advocate for tourism. Uh, previously sat on the regional board for Hunter Tourism and worked very, very hard. Once again, primarily small businesses as part of that, sm primarily small businesses. Uh, either directly or as in flow on effects to new money coming into the region uh, and then uh, augmenting the economy from there. In terms of um, locally, what would I do? Uh, I'm on the record of, of advocating very, very strongly for a signature event. Uh, I wish I had an announcement, but I, I, I don't. Uh, but that is something that I will thump the table for in terms of where it is. It makes good sense. Uh, it will be bigger than the electorate of Charlestown. It will be good for the lower hunter. And so, and the way that Charlestown is poised in terms of everything we've talked about, what is good for the lower hunter is good for Charlestown. Because within the, the centre of the Charlestown state electorate is a fairly big employment hub. And that drives so many other aspects of so many small businesses, so many people's lives rely on the commerce, the transacts in Charlestown. So uh, in terms of tourism, 
brings money to the Lower Hunter. Money in the Lower Hunter is good for Charlestown, uh, and ultimately that's good for all of us. So in terms of economic strength and moving forward, a very, very strong advocate for tourism and would be very keen to get a very, very significant signature uh, tourism event here to take the lead. Thank you. Uh, Jay? So as a general comment, uh, Australians, as I said, in general, have less disposable income. That uh, goes on to domestic tourism, uh, lack of demand. Uh, we've also uh, got other factors such as fuel prices, which are up and down. When I was a little uh, kid, we used to always go to Queensland because fuel was generally affordable. It's not so much now. Uh, we have things like, I think it was a four by four tax on petrol. It was a tax, I think, around 4% uh, excise tax that was supposed to last four years. And that, you know, might have been 20 years ago or something like that. Uh, there are not many uh, hotels uh, in Lake Macquarie itself. Uh, hearing from people visiting from Sydney, they prefer to uh, travel into Newcastle to, you know, local hotels. There's some, you know, uh, more expensive, more luxurious ones in Newcastle. Uh, but I'm also against uh, such things as paid street parking, which is uh, mooted for Lake Macquarie, uh, which makes uh, it less attractive for people to visit the area and shop locally. Uh, cutting unnecessary red tape, which I said about in a little speech about, you know, uh, compliance costs and overburden of uh, regulation uh, from government. Uh, that makes businesses, including tourism-based businesses, more affordable. <coughs> more affordable, sorry. And uh, I'll also fight further massive special variation rate rises. I understand that councils, you know, generally have to raise their income to the level of the cap, but uh, not things like 90% uh, rate rises over seven years for businesses. Thank you. Well, you'll be happy to know that there's no more questions. Oh, sorry, you can, yeah, of course. No, I just need to be really, really clear on this one. There was, there was a statement made just then about um, there's a proposal to introduce on-street parking, paid parking in this, in this region. I think it's important that it's very clear that Council has no intention of doing such a thing. And in fact, we, de we decided that, and Jason's nodding his head, we decided that together last year. Thank you, Jody. Well... There are no more questions now. Um, we've moved on for the night. I'd really like to uh, thank the candidates for giving us their time tonight and being very honest and forthcoming in their answers. Um, I wish you all the best come the weekend, but I'd like to now hand over to Narelle Redmond to, to wrap us up for the night. Um, and really look forward to working with whoever our member is, um, with the Business Chamber. Um, the, ch the Chamber is growing. We have just employed a new um, Business Development Officer who will be starting in about four weeks' time, which will be great for us. Um, our membership is actually increasing, which is showing is, is good for, for us um, and we're really trying to get out there to help small business. So we'd love to work with the, the next member who's coming on, um, work really closely with you guys so we can um, get out the word out of what's happening in small business. So thank you very much for um, coming and I think Brett is just going to about talk about the awards. So thank you. Thanks, Narelle. Um, it's always good to work with uh, Business Charlestown. Um, just thought I'd finish off with, uh, which, which is the premier business event for Lake Macquarie. It's the Lake Macquarie Business Excellence Awards. Uh, now in its fourth year, uh, it's run by the centre here, one of the things that, uh, one of our projects. So um, the nominations are now open. Uh, the website is active, lmba.com.au. Uh, the gala event will be on the 11th of July at uh, Belmont 16 Footers. Promise to be a great night yet again for our fourth year um, and uh, we're in the process of uh, actively encouraging lots of businesses now to uh, nominate. We've got some information sessions that uh, I'll be running over the next uh, month or six weeks to help businesses who want to enter to uh, maximise their chances of being successful uh, and looking to get people along to that, so help that. So, But 
Uh, certainly for, um, from the behalf of the board and the centre, we thank those who have supported us so far in the last uh, four years. And uh, in terms of our sponsors, we have Dantia uh, as our major sponsor this year and support sponsor is, uh, is Council uh, and, um, and WorkCover. Uh, and uh, we have sponsors for our categories and our prizes. And at this stage, the prize pool is, uh, I think, about 25000 and increasing uh, each week. So uh, last year, I think we were about $60,000 in prizes uh, for the recipients. So um, uh, we we're still working on that. So it's a great event, uh, the Premier Business event for Lake Macquarie. Uh, and we thank you for, uh, for that uh, support. Just an interesting, I guess, a statistic that I'll leave you with if the candidates. We have 22 businesses here in the centre. Uh, they're all incubator businesses. They're all startups uh, or growth for early growth phase. 94% of the businesses who leave this centre operate their business successfully after leaving the centre. 94%. Uh, so, uh, and we're up to about 150 have left the centre over over the last 15 years. Uh, so uh, we generally lose about four or five a year. Uh, lose as in they choose to leave, uh, in most cases. Uh, in some cases we make the choice for them. Uh, but, um, and the average stays about four and a half years. So they come in as a startup, stay about four and a half years on average. Uh, and they, they move when they are ready to move uh, in most cases. Uh, and then they continue to be successful. And the vast majority continue to operate within Lake Macquarie. So with that, um, something to take on board. Uh, so we certainly welcome the support of uh, whoever is our, our, uh, our member post the election. We wish you all the very best. Uh, and um, um, yeah, uh, no matter whether you're successful or not, we look forward to your uh, continued relationship with, uh, with the centre and, uh, and what we do here in, in um, supporting the other businesses in Lake Macquarie. So with that, um, join us to finish off some refreshments and a bit of networking before we uh, turn the lights out. Thank you. Thanks, Luke. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Duncan. Great job. Thank you. Thanks, Jodie. Because I didn't get it. Have we? Did.